Okay. Okay. Welcome all. Uh, today, an artist, Cesar Boyeshi, has been talk about his research in Hussein Bahrai Tekin Archive and his selection uh, in his library. Uh, you can also see the library uh, at South Galata in the cafe uh, in the cafe part. Thank you for your coming. Okay. Um, hold on. This is not going to be um, a, like a traditional pres presentation of, of research that has been going on. It's more like it will be um, going through a set of circumstances that somehow have connected um, Hussein and myself and a bunch of other friends. Um, but mainly um, it, it will be about how I, I sort of miss Hussein um, and how this um, uh, research, so to say, which is uh, an overstatement, uh, has led me to, um, to realize how many connections and links there were between our works, how many um, things were left uh, undiscussed uh, and how, um, I mean, there, that how, how alive his work is and his legacy. So number one is that he's not, um, and he's been known to um, make a statement to that he's not a studio artist. Um, as you probably know, there are project artists, there are market artists, there are artists, conceptual artists, and blah blah blah. Um, but he was not a, definitely a library artist either. Um, in all the archive, I, I couldn't find anything that is sort of uh, notes on books, apart from those that he took while he was a student in the Sorbonne in, in the eighties in, in Paris. Um, but at the same time, um, being Hussein, in, in his library you can find the most amazing contradictory sources. Like here on the left, it, I don't know if anybody is here from Germany or from East Germany better, but this is a book on the, um, one of the worst ever cars, uh, the, 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 <laughs> the least sturdy car ever made from plastic, it's called the Trabant. It was an icon item uh, for, East, uh, for East Germany. And right next to it, you can see a book on grammatology by Derrida, which is um, a book that, that, I mean, that contributed to the events in 1968 in France. Uh, I haven't read either one of these books, but I'm impressed by the contradiction. Um, the archive, um, I found it to be extremely well arranged. This is in Beuglo, in South Beuglo. And the most interesting, I'm going to tell you right away, and this is what I'm going to finish the presentation with, that the most interesting items that I found, provided that there are many others, but I didn't really concentrate on them, is, are in this box. And they are a set of postcards that I have here with me. Some of them are extremely communist from 1952, May 1st celebration in Russia. And the ones that I will talk about at the end are here. They are um, amazing. They are a subject of a study uh, on their own. I don't know whether uh, Hussein was aware of their content, apart from the kind of a revolutionary imagery, because he didn't read Russian, as far as I know. But since I am fluent in Russian and I can read the text, I can relate to you why they are so important at the end. There are uh, eight of them. Well, in one word, um, I loved to tease Hussein, and I also am still very mad with him. It's more than five years since he passed away, and I'm really mad at him because he, 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 he just disappeared. Uh, there are some things we needed to talk about. This is probably 2001, I think, in Skopje, 
And he wasn't very, at that time, he wasn't all that good with computers. So I, I was here, I was helping, helping him um, make a present, present his, his work, and he was doing the talking. Uh, downstairs in the, in the display, in the library, there is a small reference to, to this conference. It was called Capital and Gender in Skopje. It was curated by, organized by our colleague Susanna Milewska, whom with uh, we both of us, we worked a lot. But to give an example, how I loved to tease Hussein. This is one of his uh, famous works uh, from the last decade, uh, Guardians of the Threshold. And so it's a, con uh, it's a comparison between two visual image images. One is a very uh, is based on a very famous Russian realist painting from the late 19th century on the left hand side. I'll, I'll talk more about it. And then the right hand side, it's something about more about the Orient. Uh, so in his interpretation, these two images, it has to do with um, the verbal versus the written uh, tradition and re re uh, relaying uh, history and stories. Uh, and I will concentrate on the left part because it directly concerns me. It's based on the fa very f one of the best ever realist paintings painted in, in the whole world, the whole history of art, by Ilya Repin, a famous Russian artist from the late 19th, early uh, 20th century. This one in particular was finished in 1891, and it depicts an event which was half legend. Uh, I mean, it's a real event, but the content is not so real. I mean, we don't know whether it took place, actually. These are these Cossacks, or Zaporozhci, who lived uh, in, um, near the river Dnieper in what's today Ukraine. And here they're depicted supposedly writing a letter to the Turkish Sultan uh, Mehmed IV mm -hmm. after a certain war from 1676. So this is a source that we both knew with uh, Hussein. And this is such a magnificent painting, so well done that there is no way you don't know it. I mean, you have to know it. It's, it's displayed in, in the State Museum in St. Petersburg. But what I would be teasing Hussein if I would have had the chance, is that this is another very bad car. It's probably the worst car made by the Soviet Union, and it's called Zaporozhets. It is uh, uh, virtually the name of the car is based on the name of these Cossacks that, that he was so fascinated with. I mean, this car was based on the uh, uh, Italian Fiat 600, and it was so bad that, that you, you just cannot drive it, although they tried to make several models. It was much worse than Moskvich, which was itself very, very bad, not to talk about the Lada or the Volga or the other Soviet-made cars. So I would be teasing Hussein, how come you know about the painting, but you don't know about the car, and yet you know about the Trabant? So they, these were all uh, Eastern European cars, and, and I would have, would have expected him to know about them. But then, of course, I would have asked, uh, teased him about what the hell were they writing the, to the Sultan about, and I cannot help you that uh, cannot help sharing with you a small, a small short passage of what supposedly these Cossacks wrote to the Sultan, because the Sultan was asking them to submit to his rule. So uh, they were telling this, this poor Mehmed IV, uh, you Babylonian scullion, I don't know what that means, Macedonian will write, brewer of Jerusalem, gold fucker of Alexandria, swine herd of greater and lesser Egypt, Armenian pig, Podolian thief, Calamite of Tartary, hangman of Kamyanets, and full of all the world and underworld, an idiot before God, grandson of the serpent, and blah, 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 blah. So the Zaporozhians declare you low life. You won't even be herding Christian pigs. Now we will conclude, for we don't know the date, and we don't own a calendar. The moon's in the sky, the year with the Lord. The day is the same over here as it is over there, for, for this kiss our heirs. So that would be something that I would be talking to Hussein about, and I think teasing him uh, made him upset with me, judging from his reactions. But then I would go further on and I would say, who the hell was Mehmed IV? I mean, I didn't know bef before that about uh, Mehmed IV. He was known as the hunter, so he wasn't very ecological. He, was, he also was at the beginning of the, um, the period when the Ottoman Empire started deteriorating because, because he was so in, um, into doing non-government, government, you know, not ruling, um, but hunting, that he gave uh, all executive power to his grand vizier. And on top of everything, I would point out to Hussein that his mother was uh, Ruthenian, which means Ukrainian, which means that she came from the same part as the Cossacks from Zaporozhye, which means that it might have been interpreted this, this exchange of letters as exchange of letters between people from the same ethnicity. And so what's the big deal and why should we worry about it? But of course, at that point, uh, Hussein would have said uh, he would be uh, quite upset and he would have said, uh, my dear friend, you don't understand anything. 
you don't know anything about the Ottoman, and he would have been right. And this uh, me not understanding would you know kept on haunting me over the years. Uh, and in this this specific installation, it's called Heterotopia, uh, which was another very important, uh, obviously, uh, concept for Hussein. He picked it up from Michel Foucault. And uh, in Michel Foucault's writings, there is the utopia, which is an imaginary place, and there is the heterotopia, which is a real space, real place, which sort of concentrates, concentrates in itself everything that might be, like, like in a mirror, everything that is important, uh, all the important knots in the life of a society. An example of what is a, a heterotopia might be the, the, um, the cemetery, and, and there the, the mirror in the house, and there are many others. So this installation, I couldn't find a... Um, uh, image from that particular exhibition. This installation is from uh, this um, image here. The installation is from uh, Van Abbe Museum. It's a bit later than what I knew, but uh, in 2002, the same installation, I think, for the first time, well, uh, for the first time in, in this particular context, was exhibited in an exhibition in Graz, which was called In Search of Balkania. And I remember, um, and I regret now teasing Hussein, that he took so such, such a long time to finish that up until the very opening as if it's like the French uh, uh, salon tradition. He was not fir for, uh, varnishing his, his installation, but he was still tidying up and touching here and there bits and pieces. Uh, this installation kept on haunting me over the years, and this whole Graz situation, just like those uh, horsemen from the North Caucasus, uh, kept on haunting both the Ottoman and the Russian Empire, and some of them are still haunting uh, both uh, countries, Russia and Turkey. And I'll come back to that a bit later as well. But actually, teasing was one thing, and being mad at Hussein was another thing, and being mad implies that I need to talk to him over and over again. I mean, I don't know, there are many other, probably other people who uh, have the same feeling, but um, for me the problem was uh, one of the examples of why I was, I'm still mad at Hussein is the horses. So these are the, this is the installation from, from his catalog. This is the installation from uh, 2005 Istanbul Biennial in the old space of Salt, Beoglu. This is now the, the ground floor. And these are copies of the, copies of the uh, famous quadriga horses which were fascinating for Hussein. And I'll, t I'll, I'll take it a little bit slower because there are references to what I was doing at the time, what he was doing, and why I'm mad at him still. Well. Hussein started this in 2003, if I'm wrong, Camilla will correct me, but that was in Jaspis, in Sweden. And so this is the installation where he was uh, taking photographs and sort of dismantling by fragments equestrian monuments of heroes. I don't know where exactly this horse came from. And then, uh, ob but uh, obviously this was like a cycle of um, uh, ph photographs of representative monuments. These started with uh, Marcus Aurelius in, the an in antiquity in Rome, you can see now an original in a museum and, and a copy on the square where it was originally. You can see them in the Renaissance, in, in Venice, in Milan, if I'm not mistaken. And then you can see them at, at the end of the 19th century, actually starting with Peter the Great, which was much earlier, uh, Peter the Great's monument in St. Petersburg, but these were all related to the nation state, the period when countries were building up nation states. So uh, the, the, the conclusion that Hussein came to uh, is very similar to what I thought in, 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 in what I was doing at the time. Uh, so, my survey focused on the mystical empty presence of, of, of equestrian stat statues, horses and heroes. Thus, horses became heroes in the end. This is exactly the same conclusion which I came to, starting with this um, monument, which is actually in Sofia. In the summer of 2003, in the context of, an ex of, of, a, of a project uh, titled Hot City Visual, I was investigating the new commercial environment of Sofia dealing with uh, advertisement, new and nouveau riche architecture. It was the period of heavy investment in Bulgaria. And also a lot of Roma people, Romani people, gypsy people, were stealing high, uh, high power cables to, to sell for scrap metal. So in order to, mm, this whole cycle, which is now a big cycle titled On Vacation, in order to uh, concentrate the attention on the visual environment of the city of Sofia, I, I simply erased in Photoshop the, the figure of the horseman left the horse and this image was sent to via email from anonymous hotmail address to media contacts with one question, who stole the metal again? This later on, uh, was, uh, this was by the way exhibited in Bologna at some point in the beginning of 2004 and then it, it developed into a, um, a, a whole big cycle, as I said, on vacation 
Uh, this is um, the Henri IV uh, statue from uh, Pont Neuf in Paris. By the spring of 2005, after the uh, intervention of Erdogan Kosovo, I believe, we had to talk with Hussein. We had to compare notes. And that was fascinating. It happened on, in a small room in Londra Hotel, uh, here in Istanbul, wh while uh, each one uh, of us was working on, on one or the other. And the background is the horse in uh, Istanbul. Uh, and then uh, I, reali I realized and he realized that there is uh, a big difference because what for him was more interesting was actually the history, the process, not the object itself, not the public space, not the power, but the historical process. So uh, this, these notes I was quoting uh, went on. The equestrian statues led me to the discovery of the story of the enigmatic quadriga, the four horses, which originated in my hometown. The facts situate themselves within different ge geographies and travels. The same as the quadriga have had strange itineraries in the form of originals, replicas and copies throughout their stories and histories. I have chased the heroic horses, the alibi of the history. And this precisely um, project with the horses, which I think um, once I was present when Camilla was installing in Lille, I believe three years ago, she was really also had problems with installing, you know, I wasn't sure what, how exactly to install it. I wasn't sure either, but I, all, I was still mad, even then. Because I have a problem with the quadriga, not because of anything else. So this quadriga does not belong to Istanbul at all. It has nothing to do with Istanbul, in fact. It was created, most likely, in the 2nd century CE, uh, AD, on the island of Hios, and it didn't appear in Constantinople until the 5th century, at the time of Emperor Theodosius. What happened to it in this, during these three centuries, we don't know. Chances are it might have been in Rome, but nobody knows. In any event, for many centuries, it stayed on the Hippodrome. You can see the remnants now in, in Sultan Ahmed area of Istanbul. And then in, 2000, uh, in 1204, when the Crusaders came to and, and, and conquered Constantinople. They defeated and started the beginning of, of, of the process of deterioration of the Byzantine Empire. They conquered Constantinople, and then these horses were taken, this quadriga was taken to Venice as a, as a uh, war booty, or also maybe as a way of paying uh, by the Crusaders to the Venetians for providing the boats to get to Constantinople. Of course, the Crusaders were assholes, and they didn't ever get to Jerusalem, they stayed in Constantinople, they did very many bad things. But the thing is that this was 1204, and, um, so to say, somebody else was fighting the Latin Empire at that time, and it wasn't the Ottoman, it was actually my country. And uh, this is a, 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 a tower which uh, uh, has stayed where it is now since exactly that time. It was, in fact, constructed in the 1204 because of a particular prisoner. I'll tell you what the city is and what's the little story here. Um, this is the Tower of Baldwin. It's in the city, it still exists in the city of Veliko Tornovo. It's the medieval capital of Bulgaria, which was a capital between roughly the end of the 12th century and, and the end of the 14th century, which is the time when Bulgaria fell under the Ottoman uh, rule. And it's still there. I mean, a lot has been reconstructed in this uh, hill, Tsarevets. This is the, like the, the hill of the royal hill. But the thing is that the tower has remained there for over 800 years. Uh, this city fell uh, on July 17th, 1393, to the Ottoman Empire. I mean, bad things happened at that time. Uh, it fell under Bayezid Yildirim, the thunderbolt, the, the sultan of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, who actually conquered um, not only Bulgaria, but he also conquered Serbia and, and all the little kingdoms who probably deserved to be conquered anyways because they were fighting with each other. Uh, and uh, that lasted until 1878 when we got off the hook. Thank you very much. But the thing is that this tower is where Baldwin I of Constantinople, who died there in 1205, he was kept there. He was the first emperor, emperor of the Latin Empire of Constantinople as Baldwin, Count of Flanders, and then Count of Hainaut. And he was one of the most prominent leaders of the Fourth Crusade, uh, which resulted in the capture of Constantinople, the sacking of Constantinople, and blah, blah, blah. Now, uh, he lost his final battle to Kaloyan, the emperor of Bulgaria, and spent his last days at, as his prisoner in precisely this tower. Now, some people say that he lost his life not because he was a prisoner, but because he 
became a little too friendly with the wife of the, our emperor, but that is not, it's probably only legend. The thing is that if somebody had, uh, has some claim over the horses, that would be not only Venice, but that would be Bulgaria, because Bulgaria defeated the Latin Empire. That is how the argument with Hussein would go. And also, I would point out that uh, this tower was so important, and Baldwin, with uh, his legend and name, was so, so kind of important for both uh, peoples, that the tower survived 500 years of Ottoman rule. It's probably the only thing that was left intact during the Ottoman domination over what's now Bulgaria. Uh, which, of course, uh, leads us back again to the, to the whole point of, of sort of arguing, uh, still arguing with Hussein and having these internal dialogues as soon as a work, this work or that work would, would come up. And, of course, it will take us back to uh, the heterotopia installation and all these uh, ghosts which are haunting the works or the artists. Now, and going back to Graz, the city of Graz and the exhibition In Search of Balkania, uh, which was 2002 in the Neue Galerie am Landesmuseum Ioneum with curators Peter Weibel, Roger Conover and Adel Schufer. That's one event in 2002 and then um, there was another one much uh, later I'll talk about. In Search of Balkania, in fact, uh, started from a, from a visit by two of the curators, Roger uh, Conover, and um, a, a manuscript purchaser at that time, now uh, like a chief editor of MIT Press, uh, from from Boston, uh, he lives in Boston. I don't, you know, Cambridge. Uh, I, I think it's Boston. In any event, uh, and then Ada Schufer, who is from Ljubljana, a famous uh, curator, a writer, uh, part of the Neue Slovenische Kunst Collective. So they were in Bulgaria searching for manuscripts, and they bumped into an exhibition which was very problematic at the time in 1999, curated by a Frenchman, André Royer. It was one of the first exhibitions dedicated to the Balkans, and we all had. A lot of and a lot of scandals and quarrels with the curator downstairs. In the documents which I have spread uh, uh, among the books, there is the whole correspondence about this exhibition, about also about many other exhibitions. However, I was left under the impression that Roger really liked um, um, the whole Balkans. But now going through the correspondence, I found out that he only was interested in this particular work by Hussein. I mean, there compared to how he was communicating with other artists. This particular heterotopia Roger Canover was so obsessed with that there was no way, I mean, there was no way, it, it, it was a centerpiece. I mean, and that's probably why Hussein was so worried about, about the installation process and how, and how it will come out at the end during the exhibition. Anyhow, this Graz story is, um, uh, it came back many years later in 2001 in the context of a competition that I was part of. The competition was titled, let me see what, was titled Bulwark Against the Southeast, and it was like for a long-term artistic intervention in the public space of Graz. The idea was to commemorate the 200th anniversary of the Universal Museum Ioneum, the same museum which hosted uh, the In Search of Volcania exhibition. And the process took from the end of 2010 until March 2011. Now, the thing is that Graz has this particular status in Austria. It's, it's being, um, and that is why the competition was uh, framed in this political way. It was the place where, when the Ottoman armies would move to, to, to sort of to, to put Vienna under siege, this is where they would bump into the city, into the fortress, and then they would move sort of to the right and then go to Vienna. Graz was much too small. They were not interested, and twice they sort of bypassed it. But because of the, the, this, this um, centuries-long rivalry between the Habsburg Empire and the Ottoman Empire, Graz and Styria, Steiermark, this, the land around the city, had to build up their defenses. Their defenses consisted of building up an arsenal, of, of incredible arsenal of medieval armory, of armor, arms uh, and objects, which at some point was nearly 200,000 objects. It's called uh, Zeughaus, I think. It's, part of it still exists. So because of this Zeug House, actually, this is the, the, they started this competition because they also, in, in Graz, they wanted to dismantle this local mythology, which represents the Turks, the Ottoman, as, 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 as the pest, as, as, the, as the locusts, as the, the, the plague. And, 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 all, and consequently, nowadays, rightist politicians in Styria, they also always... Um, frame the newcomers, the migrants, uh, from, be that as may from Asia or from uh, Eastern, Southeastern Europe, they are always sort of cast in a certain way because they come from the East. 
So the competition was all about that. And Graz is, of course, uh, a city, very wealthy city with a very specific geography. Uh, and um, there is this river, river Moor, that runs um, north to south and separates the city into east and west part. And the competition, um, I mean, we all worked, like five artists, we all worked for several months. Uh, the other artists were Nasan Tur, who finally ended up uh, winning the competition. He's, he's from Turkey, he lives in, in Berlin. Then Ezra Erzen, also from Turkey, she lives in, in Berlin as well. Then the Hufriyat group, I think, Hufriyat group from Istanbul, there is there artists. And then Nadia Perlia, who is, lives in London, but she is from Western Macedonia, so she is half Slavic, half Albanian, and myself, who is Bulgarian, and I had a big problem in Graz. I said, well, you guys obviously feel very guilty because you are framing the, uh, the, the, the Turkish uh, threat or menace in a certain way, which is your own problem, it's, it's your own guilt, but don't ask me to come and help you because I, I cannot deal with on such a level. All I can do is like help, uh, sort of work with the problem of uh, the enemy and how do you define an enemy or how, how do you frame the other and how do you make him or, uh, you know, make it look negative. So anyhow, back to the competition and this is, uh, and that the, the important part is, uh, this, this is part of the arsenal uh, which is still left. It's an amazing place, a museum. There, um, at the end of the 18th century, at the time of Maria Theresia, uh, this, uh, all these arsenals were decommissioned because uh, after a certain treaty, Ottoman Empire was no longer a threat. And so Graz had to beg the em empress to, uh, to let them preserve their cherished um, armory. And this is what's left of, of that time. Uh, and of course, this is exactly, after the first visit to this magnificent place, this is exactly where Hussein came back in a big way to my life because I, and I needed him, because there is this distinct connection between the arms from the Middle Ages, the helmets in particular, and the bunkers that um, I mean, we knew, but he had worked, he had worked with uh, at some point 10 years ago or more, starting 10 years ago. Uh, and um, the thing is that in, in my, there, is a, there is a connection between these defensive weapons, with, and they're, they're very visual, they're very, um, that they are about visuality somehow who is seeing what uh, and whom and how and, and from what point of view. Anyways, uh, so the competition, uh, just to show you the context, I, I came up with a, with a certain uh, cycle of uh, islands in Graz, so to say, metaphorical islands, how to deconstruct this negative, um, in, um, negative uh, aura of Graz. Number one, this model of a double-headed uh, dove, unlike the double-headed eagle, which is usually an emblem of empires and signifies aggression and, 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 and you know the, the, the expansion of empires. Supposedly, the double-headed dove would signify the opposite. Then there is this little intervention on the main main bridge of Graz. Uh, well, unlike Europe, in Graz the west part is the poor part and the east part is the rich part. In, in Europe, it's the, op the other way around. But the main bridge connecting the two sides is next to the Kunsthaus Graz, this very famous, beautiful, architecturally beautiful place. So I, I wanted to paint the, uh, on the asphalt a slight reference to Checkpoint Charlie. So if you are going, for, depending on which direction, you're, you're, which direction you're heading, it's like there would be warning signs that you're entering the eastern sector and you're leaving the western sector. This is exactly what once upon a time was in uh, Checkpoint Charlie's this, this crossing point between East and West Berlin, which existed for decades, and it did have this particular signage saying that you are leaving the Western sector at your own risk and blah, blah, blah. Okay, but the bunkers. So historically, the helmet, we know where it is from, the bunker, although we all know, uh, I, I mean, I had seen that those bunkers at the end of 98 in Albania, they are a totalitarian product, but they were brought back into my life by Hussein. I'll tell you in what context in a, little, in, in, in a short while. The bunkers, for those of you who don't know, if there are any people who don't know what the Albanian bunkers, bunkers are, I'll just clarify, nearly 700,000 bunkers were installed all over Albania, along the, the, along the highways and the roads, on the hills, Protecting, supposedly protecting the country from, from the enemy that never came. It was the product of Enver Hoxha, the totalitarian dictator of Albania, and all the as objects they were donated by China. 
How were they installed over the hills? Nobody knows. Now it's very difficult to dismantle them. It's almost impossible. They've been taken away only near the big cities and the highways. They're still there. But what is fascinating about them in the context of arts and our artists, contemporary arts, it, it, it's what to do with the objects and how were they installed there. For me, the second part. They were installed in the s along the same visual logic along the hills uh, and over the hills of Albania as the logic used by an, an artist who is some born in Bulgaria, in fact. Uh, his name is Christo, and this is his project, The Umbrellas, the part in California from 1991. It is the same totalitarian visual thinking and management of, of objects on hills. The only difference is who sees what and for what purpose, for what, from what point. But they have the same composition over the hills uh, and the same visual kind of uh, sc the, the scale of the, this, this incredible scale of visual thinking, which on the left hand side Enver Hoxha displayed through his engineers and on the right hand side Christo. These are photographs from 1976. Of course, they're very different people. Christo has left Bulgaria in 56 and he lives in, in the States. I mean, you have heard the names, the name, by the way, his family name, the one he was born with, for those of you who don't know. It is Yavashev. I mean, it comes from the Turkish word Yavash, just like my family name comes from the Arabic via Turkish word Boya. Well, there you go. But this particular connection, although it became immediately visible uh, and, and sort of intuitively, I, 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 I saw it in uh, 1998 when I first saw the Albanian bunkers, but I had to work with this particular comparison because of Hussein, in fact in the context of another exhibition that you might have known, another one of these Balkan exhibitions, titled In the Gorgeous of the Balkans, which took place in, in the fall of 2003 in uh, Kunsthalle Friedrichsianum in Kassel, and it was curated by René Bloch, a, a common friend, somebody we have all worked with, and, and a, a great curator who has done a lot for, for the growth of, of Istanbul art scene. Um, in the, in the show for, for this particular exhibition, uh, what I did was kind of a, um, a, a cycle of guided tours. I had no physical presence in the, in the space. I only did guided tours, which means that I was sort of connecting, animating the, sp animating the space in between the works. And schadenfreude in German, for those of you who don't know, means to take pleasure in the misfortune of your friend or neighbor, which also is a very good uh, attitude. And it's, it the Balkans are famous for this attitude, to be, to be glad that your neighbor is not doing well as you very well know. So in the context of this Balkan exhibition, the point was that I, c I was there. The other artists were not there. I can say anything I wanted about their works, which of course, I mean, I had to somehow deal with the bunker. And that is the important thing here, because Hussein somehow, I still envy him. I mean, by the way, one of the criteria that I have, my own criteria for if this is a good or not so good artwork, if I have this internal feeling that I wish I made this work, for me, it's a clear sign that this is a good work. And I wish I had found a way to transport a bunker from Albania to Kassel, which Hussein did. I mean, it, oh, this whole thing started in 2002. I'm not clear exactly under what circumstances, but the idea for him was that by 2003, the fall, with the budget of the exhibition, they were able to transport one bunker for two soldiers. They, they, uh, the Albanian bunkers came in three varieties. One soldier bunker, two soldiers, and the big mama was, was like for a group of soldiers. They were more rare and consequently you know, much heavier. So this bunker was transported, installed in front of Kunsthalle Fritzian. Then it went to other exhibitions, uh, which will uh, you know, come later on into the picture. But the thing is that Hussein's idea was that each contemporary art museum would have to have one such ready-made in their collection. In this way, and, and they should take it you know, uh, and pay for the transportation, which wasn't all that expensive actually, from the hills of Albania to the, uh, to the certain museum, uh, host museum. I think it's not very many bunkers were actually uh, transported in this way. Maybe there, there is only one or two. In any event, I had to talk about the bunker and I had to connect the bunker to many other things in the middle of Castle. It's totally decontextualized, but still, there had to be a way to connect it. So one is the hills via Cristo, the umbrellas. Everybody in Castle knows about the umbrellas and Cristo. They know so many things that you would be surprised. But there was a reference, which I don't know. I, I, I believe Hussein might have had 
in mind. I'm not sure, and it's, I cannot ask him now. And the reference is just across the street from the Fredericianum. If you go to Documenta nowadays, you'll see it. It's there on the left-hand side, on the, on, the, on the pavement. You see these little objects, and that's what they look like. They, they're actually lighting uh, devices. They, they light up at night, and they, they, they you know, and immediately it becomes contextualized in a different way. Um, the bunker and these lights, it's the same form, the same kind of uh, connection, um, different scale, different function. And then I come back to Graz. All of these are in my mind, and in Graz I have to deal with a very, very difficult situation. Because I'm not Turkish, I have a problem with the Ottoman, which you probably have seen and detected by now, and I'm not the only one who has a problem with the Ottoman, but I'm on the other side compared to the Austrians. Um, so, what do I do? I wanted to transport the same bunker that Hussein had transported in Kassel, which by now is in Marburg, somewhere in Germany, after another exhibition, uh, enlisting the help of Camilla and of Vasif Kortun, and finally, and also of, of uh, somebody else who actually helped Hussein transport the bunker from Albania to Kassel, Eddie Muka, an Albanian curator. Everything was perfect. I had selected this particular spot in front of the Garrison Museum, right on top of the hill. I also uh, explained through Eddie Muka uh, how the process um, would, would, what needs to happen, how much it would cost. And there was this um, um, uh, wish to put it uh, somewhere on, on this loan and to have this uh, as an homage to Hussein al in the Center for the Study of Albanian Bunkers. And then, of course, um, I didn't win the competition, and so they, you know, they told me that maybe in the future we will realize without the bunker, but we will live like an empty space, which is again, again, um, um, a situation of luck and of missing somebody or something. And I just want to, before finishing, I just want to show you another part of this whole competition, which is consider it an homage to Hussein which did not happen in reality. But this particular part is homage to Hussein. And it is an homage to his concept of heterotopia. Except heterotopia not taken as a, as a real place in real space, in real um, situation, but as a, a way of thinking and connecting different such spaces, different spots, different facts in history. Consider this trip, travel, that you're going to take in the next 10, 15 minutes, as the same kind of travel that the quadriga in Hussein's mind was probably traveling. Originals, copies, connections, historical, real or imagined, who, which this, the quadriga, these four horses that he wanted to transport back to Istanbul and he succeeded in transporting the copies. So in Graz, as it turned out, never, no Ottoman step foot, uh, foot, yeah, okay. Uh, in Graz, uh, actually the only destruction did not come from the east, it came from the west. Actually, the armies of Napoleon, when they conquered Austria in the end of the 18th century, I believe, they destroyed nearly all the, all the fortifications of Graz. And only two towers remain because the citizens of Graz bribed the local French um, administrator of the city. So one is the um, bell tower, and, in, uh, and, and at the bottom of this bell tower, there's this footbridge. And the footbridge is there because it's, it's about 25 meters long footbridge because it, if you step on it, you can see undisturbed uh, all these uh, archaeological, uh, it's an archaeological site, there was something there, so you can take a look at it. But it's so long and then I was so sort of obsessed with somehow connecting what I was doing to, to Turkey, not only to Istanbul but to Turkey and maybe to, to, to the Ottoman that I decided to make an experiment and to follow this trip, uh, this, the, the path of this footbridge until the end of the world. And uh, with today's tools, with Google, you can easily do that. And uh, I calculated that if the end of the world is defined by the first big water you encounter, and it comes to uh, nearly 7,917 kilometers, the end of the world, and it hits in exactly one particular spot. It's an arch archipelago of, of islands with a beautiful name, the islands of the, Gre uh, of the Grey Geese. Okay, it's all the way in the end of the world. It's this, this particular set of islands here. It's so far out, it's so far away, that it's in Chukotka. You know, and, uh, if, if the engineers in Graz had put this footbridge just one degree to the left or to, to, the, to the right, the story would have had to do with Magadan and the uh, Stalinist death camps and uh, labor camps. If it was to the left, 
one degree, it would be completely different. But following several experiments with Google, this is, I came up with this, this uh, result, the Chukchi Sea, the, the islands there. And this particular archipelago is so far east that it's already uh, over the date line, so it's in the west. And so over and over doing this experiment, come up with the same, same conclusion, Chukotka, always Chukotka, always these islands, always these, this particular uh, bay. And here are some photographs from uh, Chukotka. If you think it's the end of the world, you're very much mistaken. This is where Roman Abramovich, you've heard the name, one of the wealthiest um, oligarchs from Russia who owns the football club Chelsea. Now he's collecting art. And he was arrested just today in, by the FBI in the States. That, that here, up, up here, is his private airplane. He is the governor of Chukotka. And he has invested a lot of money into upgrading in a kind of a noirish way um, the environment. Of course, there are a lot of uh, socialist uh, places, a lot of uh, monuments left, a lot of noirish places and monuments. Uh, this is what is the, the eastern, eastmost mainland, mainland point of Eurasia. It's the monument to a Russian e imperial explorer, Semyon Dezhnev, who was there in nearly the same time, in, in Chukotka, in 1672, he died there, nearly the same time when supposedly the Zaporozhian Cossacks were writing a letter to the Sultan. So there is one connection, and I, th at this point I start feeling there is a way maybe to connect all of this to Turkey. Some more photographs of Chukotka. And uh, it turns out that, yeah, okay, some, a little bit more about the islands, not in particular, nobody lives there. It's just the names, actually. So this project was about following the names. It's very much like Dan Brown thing. But I feel that there is a connection to Hus what Hussein was doing. And the connection uh, appeared soon, uh, very soon. So uh, the, the islands are guarding the entrance to a particular bay, which has the strange name of Kaluchinskaya Bay. But the thing is that in 17, this is, this is not the original name. When the Russian imperial engineers and, and uh, cartographers went to this, these parts of the world, of the empire, in 1793, they gave it the name of Count Bezborodko Bay in honor of a Russian statesman, a statesman Alexander Bezborodko. But afterwards, the, the locals could not, I mean, there's a few people living up and down the shore um, of Chukchi Sea. The locals could not get accustomed to the name, and so later on it was renamed into Kaluchin Island, Kaluchinskaya Bay, and blah, blah, blah. But the point is, who is this guy, Bezborodko? What did he do in order to, be, uh, to have this frozen land named after him? Uh, and I checked, in, it was in 1793, I checked what happened in 1793, a lot of, I mean, nothing is mentioned about either Russia or Turkey or Austria, well, maybe a little bit Austria, because, but many, very many bad things happened in, in France, a king was decapitated, the queen was decapitated, Louvre, the Louvre was opened in the same year, um, and, and George Washington did something in, in, in the cap with the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. Anyhow, this uh, Bez Borodko was actually if you follow Wikipedia, he was the, the, grand, the grand chancellor of Ekaterina the Great, Catherine the Great. He was defining, he was the foreign minister for 20 years at the end of the 18th century. What he did, and that's the important part, is that he signed uh, two peace treaties with the Ottoman Empire. One in 1774, the Treaty of Kuchuk Kainarja, which is today a village near Silistra in Algeria. Thank you very much. And his career, though, culminated with negotiating the signing of, a, of, a, of another treaty in 1792, the Treaty of Yash, which is actually the treaty that, that put, redefined the map of Europe for the next one and a half centuries. Uh, the two treaties introduced the so-called Eastern question in European history. The question, um, as it says, it, it, uh, the question encompasses the diplomatic and political problems posed by deterioration, decay, and finally, the disintegration of the Ottoman Empire over the course of the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. Now, quite simply, uh, this bay was um, located at the end of the world, was named after Count Bezborodko as a reward, as a reward for accomplishing the extremely advantageous to Russia, uh, to Russia Treaty of Yashi. Now, he, I mean, he, he, was, he was very prodigious, he was very brilliant, uh, a very, very brilliant man. He met the Austrian Han uh, Habsburg Emperor Joseph II, the son of Maria Theresia, on several occasions. He was, um, uh, so at one point, he presented to the Empress a memorandum on political affairs. Uh, 
and the document was uh, um, later on um, referred to as the Russian proposals. By that time, Turkey is no longer a threat for nearly one century. Not at all, after the, 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 the another war and a treaty in uh, Sremski Karlovac, now in Serbia. Uh, all, this is the time when all these uh, arsenals in Austria were decommissioned. But um, this guy is fascinating in many ways. Um, first of all, he was a hero during the first war that he fought. Then he had a unique memory, everybody says. He remembered all the nobles in the Habsburg court and he, he knew who needs what, so he can make a, 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 make a whole list of, of whom to bribe for how much money. Uh, then he, was, uh, he invented the way to reconstruct the Byzantine Empire with a Russian prince on top, I mean, by getting rid of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, then, um, after this war um, in 1790, 1791, he was sent to Yash to sign a treaty, a peace treaty with, with the Turks. And then the most important part of this treaty was what to do with the people beyond the Kuba River, the north and the south of the Caucasus region. And he was able to negotiate. I mean, remember now the Zaporozhci? They were where they are, in north of the Caucasus, precisely to protect the Russian Empire from these people that are the Caucasus people that we still hear about all the time. But this count was able to negotiate with the Ottoman Empire that these people of the Caucasus are the responsibility of the Ottoman Empire. So if anybody uh, uh, from, from Caucasus does something bad to the Russian Empire, they would have to be persecuted by the Ottoman Empire. That was a big accomplishment for the time. Uh, and they were called bandits and so on and so forth. So the same count later on became involved with the uh, alliance that he needed to make with Turkey against Napoleon. And then further maybe more important and more interesting, he became um, the model for the father of Pierre Bezukhov. You have probably heard of, of War and Peace, the Leo Tolstoy novel. Uh, so this Count Bezborodko was the, the, the prototype for the father of Pierre Bezukhov, one of the main, if not the main character of War and Peace. And then you see, um, you know, all these um, data is about, uh, about this count comes from the writings of a certain guy called Nikolai Grigorovich. He wrote a big, thick book about Prince Chancellor, Prince Bezborodko now, whose first cousin was um, Viktor Ivanovich Grigorovich, a Russian imp um, imperial um, traveler, explorer, who came from a city called Balta, uh, in uh, now in Ukraine, Balta in uh, means X in English. It's Balta in Turkish is X, and so in Bulgarian is also Balta. But uh, the city where he was born came into the possession of the Russian Empire after a certain peace treaty that he himself signed, uh, that that Bezborodko signed. Sorry, and he traveled in the middle of the 19th century around the Ottoman Empire. He did this and that. If you do a Google search under the name of this Viktor Grigorovich in Russian. You can get all the data, but if you do a Google search under this name uh, in English, you don't get much, but you do get my name, which is, I was amazed when I did this, it's in Bulgarian here, here in French, and here in English. And this is what I wanted, I would have wanted to discuss with Hussein, but he was not around to discuss it with him. So, um, I, it's, it's a miracle, but a miracle with very easy explanation. The thing is that I live on this street, which is named after uh, Viktor Grigorovich. And so, because of this crazy jumping here from place to place to place, I was able to get back to Graz uh, after going to the end of the world and to complete the project. And to somehow, because of this crazy connection, to come back to the archive, now here for you, and to the last part of the presentation, which is uh, involved with maybe, as I said, the most fascinating part of this collection, these several cards. Oh, I have them scanned, and I will uh, show some of them to you. First of all, um, okay. notice the, the coloring, and I'll try to interpret, to translate for you the text. The cards are from 1932, 31, 32, and they're Soviet. Here it says workers, um, 
up, uphold the international um, solidarity of, of all the working class. And then there is this uh, here part, which is uh, the, in how many languages it's written that it is a, a postcard. It's in Russian, Ukrainian, Belarusian, Georgian, Armenian, Turkish, Azerbaijani, in Arabic script and French. So the Turkish is postcard, if I'm not mistaken. Which took me some time to, to define what language, languages were used. Now, the interesting part is that there is this cycle of postcards, which on the face of it they have always kind of revolutionary propaganda imagery. Here, it's, it's a propaganda of, the, of engineering as the new faith of the Soviet Union, of the new socialist state. Then there is the... Uh, this is about the, the, the uh, um, subscription to magazines, and so education in a way, news. There is about, this is about the transport, um, ideology of transport. So remember, so it's, it's, a, it's addressed to the engineer or, or the, the somebody who works for the railroads. Remember, the technical education is a class responsibility of each worker. That's it's what it says here at the, end, at the, at the bottom. And then, uh, this is very funny, it's, it says here, preserve the sanitary defense of the Soviet Union. Buy a lottery ticket of the, for the societies of the Red Cross and the Red Crescent. Uh, okay, and then the, this is I showed you. Again, the newspapers, and then this. Uh, well, this this is such a icon. Uh, you know, it's like an icon of the Red Red Army uh, um, soldier from the civil wars, from the twenties, from the from the October Revolution, with the Budyanovsky hat, uh, and it refers here to the invalids um, and the heroes of labor. Now, the point about these cards is that on the facade they show a, a revolutionary imagery the propaganda of a state which is just about to become the first workers' as empire in the world. That's the beginning of the 30s. This is one or two years before Stalin came along. Now, on the back side of all of these, there are very intimate details about the relationship between a certain KGB officer, Cheka officer, a policeman, a militiaman, who was at that time stationed in the... Uh, actually, in Sochi, Sochi is the site where in, in one year there will be the Olympic Games in Russia. This is the Sochi. It says here. So he was a he was a KGB. He was. We don't want to know what he was, but the texts in the postcards are very intimate. I can read them in, in uh, these texts in Russian, and it's uh, as I said, it's it's like this group of cards is interesting in themselves to study, and and, and I, I I just. Uh, appreciate much more Hussein now that he was able to, I mean, if, you know, if, if you were with Hussein in a city before the opening of an exhibition or during uh, the work on an exhibition, and after hours you needed to, to do something, you, you didn't need to go anywhere, you just needed to follow Hussein. He always went to interesting places, he always met interesting people, he always, he always <laughs> was surrounded by interesting people, so that, you know, you just need to hang out with, with Hussein and, and then everything happens, you don't need to worry. Of course, Tops was when, uh, when he's in Istanbul and Hussein happens to be here, that we all know. But uh, on the back side of the postcard, you can see here names of cities where the husband, whose name is, what's his name? Ludwig Franzevich Maurer, and I searched him on, online. He, such a person exists. I mean, he, it's ref, he is referenced. I mean, you can search in, you should search in Russian, but he's a real, of course, real person, and he's not somebody that nobody knows about. He was traveling to Middle Asia, to the cities in, uh, in Middle Asia, Akchubinsk, near the Volga River, southern, uh, southern Russia, then Ashkabat, Dushanbe, Tashkent, Bukhara, these are all Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, these are cities in Central Asia. So on the facade, there is the revolution, I mean the I ideology. On the back side, there is the intimate story. But what he was doing, he was actually spreading the revolution. He was going to, to install the revolution in Central Asia. And that is fascinating. This is, this is like an incredible material document about what I'm trying to kind of relate to you and what I think was the reason why we were friends with Hussein, and the reason why it was such a pleasure, thank you, Susan, to work with this archive, 
Uh, and thank you to everybody who helped to, to, to thank you most of all Camilla for not you know being mad with me maybe <laughs> um, this is what I think is like what what connected me to Hussein we, we, we both we both take history and pol politics very personally yeah so this is and these objects here are an example of how there is like a, a real life Precedent. It's like it's not. It's not something that is like only an artistic strategy, and that's why Hussein is not either a studio artist only or a library artist only, but he's Hussein. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. By the way, if if I, I don't know if you have questions, I would be happy to answer. Thing is in Germany, we would say what you say is the back side, is a, in Germany it's the front side, and we have the image on the front side, and the written on the back side. I mean the postcards. Postcards. We have the image on the other side, and <laughs> the writing on the small side. Well, I don't know, but it's uh, usually. I, in English, you have the image on the. Well, you're right, but this is not. It, it, it's confusing, but this is 32. <laughs> Now that I think of it, it's like usually, usually, yes, of course. Nowadays, you write on the back side the address and also the letter, and on the front side, on front side, it's just the, the picture. But this is um, these are these are so delicate and such such beautiful things that I mean I didn't even think about it. <laughs> there is a. Of, of, the, of the correspondence, uh, I wish I knew how they, I mean, how Hussein and where he found them. Probably while he was in Sochi well, or, or Odessa, while he was doing his uh, Sea Elephant Travel Agency project 10 years ago. Uh, there is this, this letter from the, the addressee of the postcards, who is uh, uh, Maria Sergeyevna Maurer. With, I mean, this guy was a, of German background. He, he was part of a German minority. There was a long you know, long time German minority in Russia after Peter the Great and Ekaterina uh, the Great. Peter, the, yeah. So, um, in this letter from uh, August 21st, 1934, from Maria Sergeyevna, who is in Moscow at, on this day, to her husband Ludwig Francevich, who is in Sochi on this day, it's a beautiful description of a Congress of the uh, Writers' Union in Moscow that she attended. She probably was an intellectual. I think she was a musician, judging from some, from some references here and there. But uh, she men mentions the names of uh, Leo, Leo Kassil, Kornei Chukovsky, Ilya Ehrenburg, Jean-Richard Bloch. Uh, and she describes a delegation of uh, pioneers. These are young kids, you know, com you know, very young communists, supposedly. Uh, after a pioneer, you had to be, be a Komsomol member and then a party member, eventually. But pioneers who are coming into the hall and uh, throwing flowers, fresh flowers, on the writers and then, you know, singing songs. And, and it's, such <laughs> it's such an amazing uh, description of events that by, by the time of, of the late 70s or, or the 80s had deteriorated to... Uh, to falsch and you know to everything bad <laughs> you can imagine in society. Yeah, as I said, thank you. That's it. Yeah, I, I would like to talk a little bit of your intervention with the library itself physically. Okay. Uh, I, I haven't uh, managed to, to work on the photographs. I have only a few photographs, but there is the, you know, this is from downstairs from yesterday, and there are these little, several details. We can, if you want to, we can do, go downstairs. Or, you know. Uh, should I explain? You want me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I consciously did not, didn't want to actually to, to either start with that or concentrate on that because I think it's 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 not all that. I mean, it's it's for me it's a work, it's an installation, intervention. 
it refers to Hussein, but it is not as intimate as what I was just doing. And, and then it's a problem because the space is a restaurant, and although I think it's, it's interesting, challenging, but it is, not, it's, it is not a space which number one priority for a visitor would be to sort of to, to pay homage or attention to the library and the objects displayed there. You know, so people go in this space for another reason. So I just, my main uh, initial thing, initial kind of motivation was to make it a little bit more mysterious, a little bit more uh, intimate, delicate, separated. And uh, it, we, if you remember, we discussed maybe using curtains at some point, which somehow, I don't, th I mean, I, th I thought it wouldn't work as well. But at the same time, to have this um, accessibility, to have this, this uh, point that it's not a library, it is something, it's not only a library, it is something that is, um, a living memory, so to say, of, of an artist who is, v who is so important and influential in this city and not only in this city, that younger artists and, 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 and people my generation keep on referring to, to him, to his work. We all remember, I mean, I, 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 I posted online some photographs from this intervention and immediately there were reactions by common friends. Um, so, and then there is another thing, which is the thing between private and public. I mean, Hussein was, I think, I mean, the, each person has this special composition, but he had this, uh, he was so internally somehow delicate and vulnerable, but you needed to know, to get, to, you need to get to know him better in order to appreciate that. And he, had, he was a shy person, I think. He wasn't, he was shy. Uh, and that is why here it's, it's this also this kind of um, thing. But also there is something about Marcel Duchamp here, which is one of the major, major influences that I have worked with, uh, which is a completely different story in, in, in what way and why. And, uh, uh, but here there is this, there is this kind of, um, you approach one thing that you know what it is, but then you get, there, there, is, there are several, several, several layers of approaching the library, the objects inside. Now the, the, the selection, it's, it is a composition, it's a collage. I mean, I, it's, some people say it was different from the previous intervention. Um, it could be other objects. I think I selected quite typical objects, but it's not the, 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 in themselves the objects that are important. It's the connection, which is the, the, you know, the, the connection, which is for me the connection between artworks in an exhibition, between people. It's, it is this... Uh, in, in one word, I've tried to make something like um, um, heterotopia, or you know, in, in Hussein's terms, with from his own things, yeah, not just the memorabilia, but something that is a narrative. And if you, some, for some people, some fragments will mean more than other fragments. For me, everything means a lot. Of course, I cannot know where certain things came from, but for me, it, and I'll just uh, try to make some examples. To, to, show, to give you some examples, so that I think here is a, is a poem by Hussein's father, but I'm not sure, it's not his handwriting, it's in Turkish, I cannot read it, but it's not from Hussein. That is his manifesto, starting with, I'm not a studio artist. These are some photographs, two photographs, and this is Halil Altundere, who is somebody I came to meet nearly at the same time as I, I mean, got to know Halil nearly at the same time I got to know Hussein, and it's like they're always friends, it's not only Hussein, they are always friends, common friends. Um, his UNESCO prize from 2002, the Cetina Biennial, he got it in Cetina when he did this Moje Moje installation. We were together um, at this time. Uh, this is more like family things, you know, the dolphins, the, the, the two people rowing in a boat, and even his obsession with the, the world. Uh, this is Bulgaria here, Varna, during the Sea Elephant uh, Travel Agency project. This is a, a Saint Constantine. It's one of the famous resorts in in, um, in Bulgaria, and so is this particular photograph here, Varna. And this is like, I mean, um, I was there are several. Um, there are some postcards which are of religious um, substance. There are many postcards in in the archive. Some are, I mean, it's it's uh, it's almost like an ethnographic um, interest. It's not definitely not religious interest, but there are Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, there are many. So this is probably one of the most famous, uh, again, 19th century Russian paintings. It's about 40 years before Ryepin and the Zaporozhtsi, 
writing a letter. This is from Alexander Ivanov, and it's like the, the, the appearance of Jesus Christ in front of the people, but I mean, it's also extremely beautiful. It's in Moscow, this particular painting. But then I didn't know what to do with, with an, another set of postcards, which are Muslim postcards. I mean, I, I know about the religion a little bit, but I'm not a believer, believer in either, you know, anything. I'm an atheist. So I didn't want to offend anybody, but I needed to have this as a background. So in the background is the postcards that depicts the 12 um, imams of, 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 of Sunni Islam, I think. And yet they disturbed me. I, I mean, they looked a little bit that I didn't want to have so much visible. So that's why they are hidden behind something that is American. I mean, it's, and it's, I thought it might be a reference to. I mean, I'm sure that Hussein would have paid such attention. You know, compassion, religion, uh, help, humanitarian or not. I mean, it's like how every humanitarian help is also disturbing or damaging something. I mean, you cannot just go and help somebody without asking and investigating what the needs are. So there, you know, there are such such things. There is here a little bit from Ankara, which I didn't know what to do. The mausoleum of, of Ataturk is visible, an angel, and then there is a little bit more about the Black Sea. And this is this is uh, of course Camilla, which is part of the uh, part of the Christian part, <laughs> the Virgin Mary. And there is there is one delicate thing here, of course, um, capital and gender. I mentioned this exhibition. And this lady here, which is a nest, it's a very beautiful image, but we agreed with Sazen that we're not going to show Kurba and the origin of the world and, and this shaven uh, painting by Kurba. Although, in fact, I think it, when, I, when I was present, we were together in Skopje in 1999, the summer of 1999, when it was, I think, it was shown for the first time during a project by uh, Susanna Bilevska again. But I'm, I cannot, I'm not completely sure, but I think it was this occasion. And I was fascinated by this painting, but at the same time, it always disturbed me. I thought it's not very well photoshopped. <laughs> That's one thing. But then probably that was just my excuse not to feel comfortable with the painting. And um, so we decided not to show it, but I couldn't help not showing. Is there here anybody reading Cyrillic? Cyrillic, Cyrillic letters, Bulgarian, Russian? Well, this is, again, it comes from Bulgaria, but it might, if you speak Russian, it means penis. It's one of the... Uh, one of the very popular, especially in Russia, words for penis. So, at least here, it's in Cyrillic. So, it's not that damaging, but I'm happy that I have it, because that is also part of the whole story. Um, what else? This is the corner. I mean, I was obsessed how much material there is from Russia, from Soviet Union, in Russian language. There is much less in Bulgarian or Serb or any of other Cyrillic languages. But Russia? Thousands. Of course, you know, I've kept on referring to the Zaporozhci and the, and the storyteller, the Oriental, but there are mm, a bunch of ID cards. They're fascinating, from the, again, ranging from the 30s to the 50s. There are, for instance, uh, a hero of labor here. <coughs> this is, um, uh, this, the blue one is an uh, is a, is a ID card of somebody who, uh, uh, let's say, an, uh, an ex-alcoholic. <laughs> It's like it's, it's a membership card for, card for the society of uh, people who do not drink or smoke from Soviet times. And other such, um, so there is here is a, like an ID card of a, of a sailor or a, you know, a, a, a Soviet made watch and then new, new cigarettes, uh, nostalgia about Stalin. And there is, of course, here the Lenin reference, and there, that's, a, that's a, a, a nearly fully preserved uh, journal, a diary of a. Of a of a, uh, somebody, Ekaterina Nikolaevna Tirnavets, who was um, who is actually um, um, the con uh, the concertmeister. How do you say in English concertmeister? So it's like the, the musical director of of uh, something uh, of the orchestra of what is now the you know the Gorky Park in Moscow. They have a house for culture and art, which used to be people's house. Now it's, it's slightly transformed into, into a, a contemporary art museum by Roman Abramovich and his wife, Daria, uh, Dasha Zhukova. So she was the, the Kapellmeister master of this particular house of culture. And uh, there is a, I mean, it's a beautiful reference here, by, uh, a, a quote by Lenin that, that refers to the class awareness of the workers. But I mean, I, it's a bad photograph here. I cannot read it. And of course, this is the um, one accent. Anybody remember where this comes from? Comes from? 
this particular version of a fist, fist is always like rod front, I mean, it's like a, 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 a revolt, that signifies revolt. This particular graphic symbol comes from the, uh, the time of the 1999-2000, and it was the emblem of, a, of an org organization of activists in, in Serbia, which is called Otpor. Otpor means, um, again, like revolt, let's say revolt. I mean, uh, I cannot translate it literally. Uh, and they were f uh, activists who wanted to get rid of Slobodan Milosevic, if you remember the, you know, the guy who sort of actually destroyed ex-Yugoslavia and he did a lot of bad things in Kosovo. But this particular fist was also used, and there is a direct connection between the Arab Spring from two years ago in Cairo, the uprising in Cairo, and their graphic signage, and this particular fist. The guys in Cairo, I mean the activists who were organizing themselves on Facebook, they were sharing, comparing notes and learning from the experiences of the guys in Serbia from 10 years before that. And they were also using parts, some parts of the graphic signage. And this particular fist, if you, if you search through the visuality of the Arab Spring, specifically in Egypt, you will find a very similar fist. I mean, there are some uh, other elements, but it's, you know, this, it's a very typical graphic solution. So that is this, this particular little part. Uh, this is the bunkers, Sarajevo. Um, um, yeah, this fascination with the, the world and then the, the end of the world, Sarajevo. And then Moji Moji is from Cetinje, 2002. I, I was, you know, the boys, boys thing. I mean, there, there's li little here. I don't have all the photographs, but you can see them. There is this very typical black, uh, blue and white cigarette box, the Bellomore Canal, uh, which is un um, under the boys drawing by Hussein. The Bellomore Canal is also so Soviet product of forced labor. It's a famous place. So there are all these references. I mean, if you if, that refer to various histories of various countries. Mm. This here, this is, of course, the, the first, one of the first drawings about the bunkers, Albanian bunkers, and this here on the, on the up, uh, right hand upper right-hand corner, round one, so <laughs> I don't think I have a better photograph of that, but it's like round one is between an artist and a curator, and it's a drawing by Dan Perzhovsky, a very famous artist from Romania, who has worked here, we have been in endless exhibitions together with Hussein, or, you know, or in different combination, combinations. And this particular drawing refers to uh, an exhibition in 1991. I mentioned it, uh, Inventing a People, by a French curator, André Rouillet, and we were all unhappy with that exhibition. And we were fighting with the curator, and that's why uh, round one is like a fight between an artist and a curator. There is also, next to this drawing, there is a, the, the letter on the other, uh, written on the back side of the drawing, which Dan wrote to Hussein. Um, these are here the sketches from the uh, the work with the hotels, the hotel signage. Oh, this is one of the first sketches. Ah, yeah, okay. So ah, there is the uh, here is round one. So <laughs> uh, the artist is, I think, on the left, and the curator is on the right. Uh, good to meet you in Sofia. I don't have a catalog yet, but the newspaper, this newspaper, you know, he Dan was is still is all the time sending newspapers with his drawings. Um, this is about the Balkans. Yeah, the football on the Balkans, the Balkan hotel in Belgrade. The, the Balkans are famous for their bears, uh, tobacco, and uh, obviously. The Balkan part of the story is that it is this unstable, interrupted history that fa Hussein was fascinated with. And that's why the, this, this here, it's part of a project of our common friends, the Irving Group, Irving Group from Ljubljana. It's the part of this New Slovenian Kunst Collective. And they have this long time uh, going, this project which has been going on for, 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 for many years, the East Art Map. And that's their logo, you know, slogan, history is not given, please help us to construct it. Yeah, I mean, these are some of the things. I mean, there are others. There, there is a part about smoking, and, and there is a part about Wittgenstein. There is a part about relationships that, in my mind, is like a boxing match and boxing reference. There is a part about going places. And, ca and why was he obsessed with caviar? Tell me. <laughs> caviar. There, in the archives, there are so many things. Like <laughs> experimenting with you know, this and that. Yeah. 
stuff like that. Initially, we thought that maybe um, we need to to have. But I mean, I thought that it might be nice to have some holes kind of cut into the into this, so that that the attention is concentrated on some books. But as I could never be sure which books were important, for some I was sure that might be important for Hussein, but not about that many. So it would have been too um, frivolous. <laughs> Thank you.